Hey, this is Michael Carter, lead pastor here at The Life Church, and I just want to thank you for watching this rebroadcast of this week's message. We hope it's in some way an inspiration to you and that there will be things that you can apply to your own life to help you along your journey. I'm really glad that you're wanting to grow in your relationship with Jesus, and I believe the Word of God will help you do just that. So be encouraged, and if there's something in the message that helps you or rings true with you, we'd like you to respond. You can leave a question or a comment or even a prayer request in the comments below. I'm praying for you, and I hope you have an amazing week. Our series, I Am Jesus, concludes today with Jesus painting a picture for us with such imagery that it brings us right to the heart and the mind of God. The last of the seven I am statements, it's not a, just a commandment by Jesus, as if he gives us a command and he sits back to see if we're going to obey it. No, this statement here brings us right to the heart of God and puts us in relationship with Jesus as co-laborers, come on, and uh, joint heirs with him. And it really culminates all of the other I am statements, including I am the resurrection, the one that we're going to talk about for a few moments today. Now, we've, we've heard and we've talked about some of these statements like, I am the bread of life. He is our very sustenance. We can't do without him. And I am the light of the world. We talked about that. He's the one that shows us the way. I am the door of the sheep. He is the door. You can't get in. You have to go through him. And of course, if he's the door of the sheep, he's the good shepherd. Come on. He is the good shepherd. My favorite statement, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He went on to say, no one comes to the Father except by me. Last week, we talked about I am the resurrection. Today, I want to look at John chapter 15, and he makes the final of these statements where he says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. I am the true vine. John chapter 15, beginning at verse 1, Jesus says these words. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches." He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. This passage and this statement is pretty dramatic, if you think about it. it it's, it's Jesus' M.O., really. And, and as I've said many times, for me personally, it's one of the reasons that I serve him. Obviously, other than he is the God of the universe and the very word of the Godhead and the Savior of us all. But one of the reasons that I love Jesus so much is because there's no ambiguity in him. I am the true vine. I am the true vine. And this statement is so dramatic because he says, not only am I the vine, and if you're in me, you'll produce much fruit. But he says, if you're apart from me, you can do nothing. That's pretty dramatic, folks. And as much as this statement brings us into relationship with Jesus, it also presents an ultimatum for us and really a provocation. 
an ultimatum, meaning that it's either this or that. There, there's, there's no ambiguity. There's no middle ground. There's no straddling the fence. It's either this or it's that. You abide in me and I abide in you. You'll bear much fruit. Or you're away from me and you can do nothing. In other words, whatever you do will not be fruitful. It may be false fruit. It may seem like fruit, but it will not be fruitful. Why? Because I am the true vine, he says. And it's a provocation because how will you respond? Provocation just means it's something, maybe a statement that's put before you that you have to respond to. You don't have a choice. It draws a response from you, okay? This is a bold statement, and Jesus is provoking you to respond to, I am the true vine. Are you going to stay with me? Are you going to stay with me? You can't say, well, I don't know, really, let me think about it. No, it's either this or that. Here's what you have to understand. By making no choice, you're making a choice. By not making a choice and say, well, I, I'm not so sure about that. It, it's, I, I'll just have to think about it. You're making a choice. You're either with me or you're against me. And I'm sorry to come at you like this this morning, but Jesus wants you to draw into a relationship with him. He wants you to come right into his heart. Even if you've confessed with your mouth and you believe in your heart the Lord Jesus and you're saved and you're going to heaven, Jesus is not done with you and your time here on earth is, is ongoing. Right? As long as you are here, he wants to bring you closer to him. He said, I come that you might have life and that more abundantly, not just when you get to heaven, but now in this time, now in this time, my blessings are for you and my relationship is with you now in this time. And so that's, that's a provoking, that's a provocation. Are you going to serve me now? Are you going to serve me from a distance? Are you going to look and see the other people worshiping and the other people in relationship with God and keep your distance and say, well, I'll just live the way I want to and go to heaven at the end? Or will you come into relationship with me? See, there are benefits for staying connected to God. It's not enough. It's not enough now to be saved. For those who don't know the Lord, I would tell them, just, just, just confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart. Get a revelation of the Messiah. Get to that point. But now that you're there, it's time to go higher. It's time to go higher. How do you know that Jesus has this mindset? We just read it because he says, every branch in me that does produce fruit, my father prunes. Why? so that it can bear more fruit. Oh, he's all about more. We're not done. We're going higher. And then when we get there, we're going higher. See, we serve a God that goes from glory and takes us from glory to glory to glory to glory until we are with him. So there's benefit in staying connected. And I want to give you three things briefly. That uh, what, what staying connected to Jesus allows us to do. If you're taking notes, you might want to jot these down. You might know them, but it helps sometimes when you just jot it down and, 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 and commit it to memory. The first thing is, is obvious, and, and it's what we've been talking about. What staying connected to the vine and staying connected to Jesus allows us to do is it's obvious. It allows us to bear fruit. It allows us to bear fruit. In verse 2, he said, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it will bear more fruit. The question for me becomes, what fruit is it that Jesus wants us to produce? What is the fruit that Jesus wants us to produce being connected to the vine? Well, we would know that Jesus really told us, really commanded us in Matthew 28 to go into all the nations, right? And so we know it's our job to preach the gospel 
to those that don't know Jesus, to live a life. Maybe you're not a preacher. Maybe you're not a good speaker or an orator. Or maybe, you know, your words don't come out right. But I tell you what, you can live a life that glorifies God and it will draw people to you. And then at the right time, the Holy Spirit will give you the right words to say. And your words could be all jumbled up, but because of the anointing on the words, that person say, well, I just want to serve Jesus. And you might say, well, I didn't even say that. My words were jumbled up. You might say, well, I got it. I got it. So we know that we want to bring unbelievers to Christ. In John chapter 4, we would know that Jesus said, listen, the harvest, the harvest is ready. The harvest is ripe. The harvest is white. It is ready. We need more harvesters, to be honest with you. There's a harvest out there. Don't worry about the harvest. We need more people to go harvest the harvest. Come on. And so he said, I'm sending you out to harvest. So we know that there will be fruit from people. And then once people are brought into the kingdom, we would know that Jesus wants us to disciple him. Go into all the world making disciples, not just Christians, not just saved people, not just people who go to church and shout every once in a while. Go into all the world and make disciples. And so discipling people produces fruit as well. People coming to Christ to be Christians, people who are disciples. But can I present to you the highest level to me of fruit? Now, those are important. People coming to Christ is, is ultimate. I mean, it's important. We would know that. He died on the cross for that. People being discipled is important to him. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Bible says that Paul told uh, the church at Ephesus that he gave us apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists for the equipping of the saints to teach so that we will all come to the maturity of Christ. So he wants us to be discipled until we would be mature and mature and mature. But when you look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, you really see the fruit that Jesus wants us to produce. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Some of y'all know that. Long-suffering. Come on, long. Come on, Virgil. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So let's go back. Take those off. Let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back. Let's go back, Tegan. Let's go back to the very first one. Let's look at love. Here's my definition of love. My definition of love is the giving of oneself at the expense of oneself for the benefit of others. The giving of oneself at the expense of oneself for the benefit of of others. I said the giving of oneself at the expense of oneself for the benefit of others. If you want to know how Jesus loved, that's how he loved. That's how he loved. He gave himself at the expense of himself. Come on. He just didn't die on a cross as if he was a firing squad just shot him and it happened. He was humiliated in front of his mother and friends, and disciples, and people who had been following him. He was spat upon, and beaten, and smacked, and all of those things before he died at the expense of himself for the benefit of others. Now, we don't have to go through that, what Jesus went through physically, but I can tell you this, people are going to talk about you. People are going to talk. If nobody's talking about you, then you're not doing everything right. If nobody's talking about you, then you're probably pleasing too many people instead of Christ. Come on. Today, in today's world, in this city, if nobody's talking about you, then you're conforming. I'm just telling you. And I'm not throwing shade because I got to look in the mirror all the time and say, look, I know you want to please people, but I'd rather please God. That's what the disciples, that's what the apostles said. And then joy. All of these I consider as one fruit, by the way. If I... For me, I'm, that maybe it's semantics and maybe we can argue about it. I won't argue with you about it. But for me, I don't say there's nine fruits of the Spirit. I don't say that. Because it says, but the fruit of the Spirit, and he just lists off these nine attributes. So to me, you got to have them all. That's all I'm saying. 
I'm saying don't have a cup. Don't say I got love and I got joy, you know, but one of these days I'll try to figure out long suffering and it'd be okay if I don't have kindness. I mean, at least I got 80%. But God wants you to have all of them. Maybe you don't have all of them today, but you got to be striving toward it. The Holy Spirit brings this out. You don't have to go to the gym to get these, (laughs) right? It's about the Holy Spirit in you. Joy is a deep-rooted, inspired happiness coming from the realization of God's goodness. That's what, and that's why no one can take joy away from you, because God's always going to be good. So if God's always going to be good, and you have a realization of his goodness, then you would have a deep-rooted, inspired happiness. And then peace. Now, we know we would think peace, peace, that means nobody's arguing, we ain't, we're not fussing. But the but peace, the, the biblical uh, version of peace or, or biblical peace is even more than just the absence of conflict. In fact, in the Old Testament, peace really was this concept of wholeness, total health, total welfare, right? Even peace with yourself. Some of us aren't at peace with ourselves. Some of us look in the mirror, we're not even at peace with ourselves, much less peace with God, much less peace with others. Come on. But it's a wholeness, a whole peace. And then long suffering. Long suffering. Simply, pay, you know what it is, patiently enduring offense or hardship. Long suffering doesn't mean, there's a couple words in here that I think people would, would look at as part of the fruit of the Spirit and say, well, I just, I'm, I'm some sort of mat that people walk over. I just have to give myself and people. It doesn't mean that people are just going to, uh, God's going to allow people to walk over you all the time and you're just here to be walked on and treaded on. No, no. But patiently enduring offense or hardship is something that Jesus is calling us to do. That's a hard one. I'm telling you. That's a hard one, even for Pastor Mike. You say, man, this guy, you are such a nice guy. But I'm telling you, man, it's it's hard sometimes when people talk about you and they say the same thing over and over and over again at some point. You know, I go back to uh, my grandfather saying, you know, you can only, you, you can't get blood from a turnip, you know, or you can only squeeze so much juice out of an orange. After a while, (laughs) come on, that's a hard one. But Jesus has called us to do it. He did it. Holy Spirit's in us. We can do it. Kindness. We think we know what kindness is. Well, treating others with respect and niceness with a posture of gratitude. With a posture of gratitude. Some of us miss that sometimes. And even listening to it now, I think it's going to go over some of our heads to, to, because you think because you, you do something or you say a nice word. But what's in your heart? That's the key. Right, Jody? That's the key. What's in your heart? Am I just saying something kind to you because my wife is listening, so I'll, I'll compliment Jody? Or someone else is listening to make myself look good? You might be doing an act of kindness, but you're very self-centered. Come on. You're very self-centered. And so kindness is treating others with respect and niceness with a posture of gratitude. Kindness is really more about the heart. The next one, goodness, is really the act of being kind. Kindness is really something you have in your heart. And then goodness is that act. It's that kindness played out, right? It's the act of being kind. Faithfulness, the consistent allegiance of being true to your word or commitment. Woo! The, the consistent allegiance of being true to your word or your commitment. You've heard these sayings, these cliches, like your word is your bond. And, and though it's, I say this about a lot of cliches, there are some things that are cliches and we get tired of hearing them and they're, we use that word, oh, it's a cliche. Yeah, but it doesn't mean it's not true. It doesn't mean it's not true. What if, what if God was not faithful? What if he was sometimey? What if he didn't show up? If he said he's going to be there at 8, and he, and he didn't show up exactly at 8, and it was no big deal to him. Oh, well, don't worry about it. I'm here. One of the things that I think I, I get on my, maybe my wife's nerves probably and, and others' nerves is one of the things that, that I try to live by is the fact that 
when you, you need to be on time, and again, I'm not throwing shade to you, so don't think I'm talking to anybody personally, okay? But when, this is just one example of faithfulness. Faithfulness covers a lot of things. But when, when we say we're going to have an appointment or we get together, or we're, we're getting together for a men's meeting, all right, and the men's meeting starts at 6 p.m., and we all need to be there at 6 p.m., well, if I come to the first men's meeting and I get there at 5.53 and then maybe somebody comes at 6 and then uh, the leader doesn't come to about 6.03 and then everybody gets there about 6.07 and we can finally kick off about 10 after 6 and that happens the first time and then the second time we have a men's meeting that same kind of thing happens and then after that I say, well, nobody else is getting there. I'm just going to get there, you know, at around 6 or a little after 6 and my excuse is no one else gets there. But can I tell you this this morning? It ain't got nothing to do with no one else. It's about you. You're supposed to be there at 6. I don't care if nobody is there at 6. It's about you. You and your commitment. I know that doesn't sound right. Why? Because we're so used to our flesh. We're so used to what the world does. God doesn't do it that way. I ain't got nothing to do if you get there late. If you get there late every single time. But as far as, as, as what I committed to, I'm going to be there at the same time every time. And again, when I talk about time, don't take offense. This is, just, this is just an example, right? I'm really talking about faithfulness and your commitment to things, your commitment to God, your commitment to others, okay? Faithfulness, it's a tough one. Probably we thought long-suffering was a tough one. Faithfulness may be the toughest one because we use the excuse where no, everybody else is not doing it. That's what my kids say. And, and, and you know what? Jesus, Jesus confronted Peter with that. You remember? He was walking with Peter, and they were talking. And he said, hey, Jesus, well, what about him? He said, this ain't got nothing to do with John. If, if John remains till I come, that's on John and me. I'm talking about you and me. Until we get that in our mind, until we get that in our heart, it's going to be difficult for us to understand true faithfulness. And I hate to say that harshly. I'm sorry, so I got to use gentleness. Gentleness. Yes, I know. Gentleness. I'm sorry. I apologize. Please forgive me. Gentleness is a posture. <laughs> and really, it's really submitting your strength to a meekness with a posture uh, that's not easily provoked. A posture of meekness. Again, this is another one of those, you're not a mat where somebody's going to run you over and just tread over you. That's not what this means, okay? But it's a posture of meekness, all right? You're not easily provoked. And then, <laughs> the, the, really the culmination, self-control. Come on. Here's how I define self-control. You determining the behavior of your thoughts and flesh. Your thoughts and flesh are going to have a behavior. But if, you're, if you have self-control, you determine the behavior of your thoughts and flesh. And many of us, including me, still fight to conquer self-control in some areas, right? It could be any area of your life. Self-control. God wants us to have it. So when we talk about, by the way, I'm still on point one and I'm just going to keep going. I only got two more points, so we're going to get through it. Um, but... Uh, and I don't have this many sub points for the other points, so, you know. But when you talk about, I wanted to really flesh this one out because when you talk about, what we're talking about here is bearing fruit. He said, I am the true vine, and if you stay in me, you will bear fruit. So this is really, we're talking about bringing people to Christ. That's fruit, right? Who else did you witness to? Discipling others. Who did you share with that's already a Christian? How did you help them along, right? How did you help disciple them? But then, how about the Holy Spirit work in your life? The Holy Spirit work in your life. Did you produce fruit with that? And number two. So the first thing is that it allows the branch to produce fruit. The second one is it allows the branch to grow. You can't grow if you're not connected. There's no way. It's impossible. You can't grow if you're not connected. John 15 verse 6 says, If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered. You're disconnected. And they gather them and they throw them into the fire and they're burned. And they're burned. You can't grow. You can't grow if you're not connected. How many of you have ever looked at someone else and, and, and seen what, what they've done and thought to yourself, man, I could never do that. Right? 
I would never do that. I would never talk like that to somebody. I would never steal from the company. I would never have an affair. I would never treat someone that way. The truth of the matter is you have no idea what you're capable of if you're not connected. I'm telling you, you have no idea what you're capable of if you're not connected. You should see some of the thoughts that go through some of our minds including me, if I, if I haven't had a, a good prayer life this week and I haven't done devotion and I haven't, you know, read my scripture and I've kind of got away from it for a while, because one of the things is when you don't do it one day, it, listen, you're not condemned. You just get up, do it the next day. But then when you don't do it the next day, all of a sudden what you find is a week has gone by. And then you, you feel crazy. You think crazy. You don't know what you're capable of if you're not connected. But conversely, if you're connected, you have no choice but to grow. You're receiving the wisdom, the knowledge, the strategy, the the nutrients, the protection, the encouragement of the vine. You're receiving all that the vine has to offer simply because you're connected. You don't have a choice because of the way Jesus, if you're connected as part of the body of Christ. Listen, Paul said this in Ephesians. Uh, verse 5, chapter 20, I mean, ver- chapter 5, verse 29. He says, no one ever hates his own body, but feeds it and takes care of it, just like Christ does the church. Common English Bible version. Just like Christ does the church. If you're connected, you're going to get part of that nourishment. He's going to take care of you. You're going to grow. You don't have a choice but to grow if you're connected. That's why it's important to stay connected. That's why it's important to stay connected. Many of us just feel like, and listen, going to church every Sunday in a year is not going to get you into heaven. It's simply not. That's not going to get you into heaven. We know that. We know that. But there's a reason why the writer of Hebrews said, you know, don't forsake the assembling together. It helps you to stay connected. It's a reason why we have small groups It's a reason why the ladies of life get together, ladies who are not able to go. I just want to encourage you. It's one of those things. And and maybe you're not able to, you know, maybe we're not able to do all these things. But that's why the church should have a variety. We should have a, a multitude of things. And in addition to that, we should be getting together also outside of church, not even at small group. Just call each other up sometime and go out to lunch. Me and some of the men, we went out to to breakfast, uh, you know, the other morning. Just of no, no agenda, just a fellowship and eat a little bit. We probably should have went to breakfast and then the gym, but we didn't. But get together, fellowship, staying connected to each other keeps you connected to the body and it keeps us connected to Jesus. And then lastly, it allows us to access God's promises. In verses 7 and 8 of this chapter, he said, If you abide in me, my words will abide in you. You will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. But this, my, by this, my Father is glorified. And that's sometimes what we leave off. You say, well, I can just ask God for what I want, and he'll just give me anything. And then, But Jesus said, by this, my, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you'll be my disciples. Let me tell you something about this verse. When you're connected to the vine, you have access to the power, to the ability, to the wisdom, to the anointing, and most importantly, to the heart of God, to the heart of God. We know that in in the book of James, it says, you have not because you ask not, and even when you do ask, you ask amiss. The Living Bible puts it this way, verse 2 of chapter 4 of James, he says, and yet the reason you don't have what you want is that you don't ask God for it. And even when you do ask, you don't get it because your whole aim is wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. But you see, when you're connected to the vine, you're connected to Jesus. And when you're connected to Jesus, you're connected to God. And when you're connected to God, you're connected to the heart of God. So you can be, you can, you can be prevented from being like a spoiled child. See, not connected, you'll look at that verse and you'll do things, you'll, you'll, you'll ask for things like you're, you're, you're not thinking about anyone else but yourself. You're, you're immature and, and nearsighted. Not connected, you're, you have a self-centered mentality, okay? When you're not connected to God, you have this ungrateful attitude. 
That's what a spoiled child does, being not connected. But when you're connected to God, you're connected to the vine, your mindset is this. It's when I increase, others increase. When I increase, it brings glory to God. When I increase, I have a grateful attitude. That's what happens when you're connected to God. And so then you won't ask amiss. So then how do we stay connected? Let's finish this off. How do we stay connected to the vine? Very simple. Two very simple things Jesus told us. First one is do what Jesus says do. You might say, well, okay, yeah, I mean, that seems very simple. Okay, well, I got a scripture for you here in a minute. We often make following the commands of Jesus so complicated as if everything Jesus says, we take it as he's speaking in code. So we have to go get some reference material and we have to pray in the spirit and we have to figure out what he's exactly saying. He said it very plainly. Now, I'm not telling you don't have devotion and don't have a concordance. Yes, absolutely. But sometimes Jesus says something very plainly. Don't commit adultery. Don't commit fornication. Love others as I have loved you. Don't lie. Don't steal. Don't cheat. Well, let me go back and figure out what he's trying to say. (laughs) And in, in verse 10 of chapter 15, Jesus was very plain. He said, if you keep my commandments... You'll be able to abide in my love just as I have kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. So he gave us an example. Keep my commandments and you abide in my love. You don't have to figure it all out. It's very simple. If if my wife tells my son to go clean the kitchen, go clean the kitchen, he knows exactly what she wants him to do. He knows better than to come back later and say, you know what, mom? I heard what you said. You said to clean the kitchen. And I went and I meditated on this thing. Oh, yeah, I got it in my spirit. Uh-huh. Yeah, I thought about it. I meditated. And, and it's in there. You said, clean the kitchen. How do you think she would respond to that? Did you clean the kitchen? Or what if he goes back and he, he, he comes back and he says, hey, mom, I looked up clean the kitchen in the Greek. And I could quote it to you in the Greek. I know what the Hebrew says. I know the etymology of each word. Clean the kitchen. Whoo, I know what it means. So I, yeah, I'm, I, I think I'm there. Or he didn't gather a group of his friends and get together and say, let's talk about this. Now, what does clean the kitchen look like? What does it look like? No, he doesn't do all those things. He better just go clean the kitchen. But why do we treat Jesus that way? Why do we treat him that way? When he says, do for others what you want them to do for you, there's not much ambiguity in this statement. Not much ambiguity. He made his thoughts on this pretty clear in Luke chapter 6, verse 46. He said, why do you call me Lord and you don't do what I tell you to do? Did you know that was in the Bible? Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Why do you call me Lord and you don't do what I tell you to do? Pretty simple. So he Again, made it plain, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in me. Just do what I say do. And then love like Jesus. This is my commandment that you love one another. Verse 12, as I have loved you. Well, how has Jesus loved us? One of my favorite passages, Ephesians chapter 5. In the message version, verse 2 says it this way. Observe how Christ loved us. He was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of of himself to us. And then Paul said, love like that. Think about that. Think about that. Observe how Christ loved us. He was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love us in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself, everything of himself to us. Love like that. How do you stay connected? The only way to love like that is to stay connected. And the only way to stay connected is to love like that. It goes hand in hand. So my question would be simply this. What fruit is being evidenced in your life? What fruit? Love, joy, peace, patience, bringing people to Christ, discipling someone, kindness, self-control. What fruit is being evidenced 
in your life. Because as, as we remain in Jesus and he remains in us, we're going to bear fruit. We're going to bear much fruit. And as we do that, we love each other. We love each other. And it's God's love that is in us. And we build each other up. And as we love each other, we remain connected. We find ourselves one day in the middle of a miracle because we're connected. God is doing something in us and producing fruit. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. 